If you are what you think about, then you have to start getting real careful about what you think about. Now you have to start this with being cautious about every conversation that you have with your friends, with your relatives, with your mother, with your husband, with your children, that focuses on what's missing in your life. Because if you want to attract something into your life, something good, something grand, something godlike, something prosperous, something of well-being, you know, health, whatever it might be, uh, if you want to attract that into your life, but you're talking about what's missing, and thinking about what's missing, and you understand that what you think about is what expands, you will continue to expand more of what's missing, and you'll continue to attract what's missing in your life. I never talk about what's missing in my life. I only put my attention on what I intend to create. And I have shifted it, and I learned this lesson a long time ago, but the place that it probably expresses it better than any is Esther and Jerry Hicks' book, Ask and It Is Given. The teachings of Abraham is called Learning to Manifest Your Desires. Have more than anything, I think they're the, the greatest, among the really greatest teachings on the planet today. And I know Esther and Jerry, I know them well, I've been with them on many occasions. It's about practicing this idea of not putting your thoughts on what is missing and shifting it to it's on its way. It's on its way. It's on its way. Four words, just get them tattooed someplace inside of you. Whatever it is that you would like to attract into your life, know that it's on its way. And I want to say to you that as you begin to get your thoughts more harmonized with Tao thinking, that is with the thinking of the source, the thinking of God, that which always has been, that which does nothing but leaves nothing undone, as you begin to more and more harmonize in this way, what happens is that you start elevating your thoughts so that the habit of how you think becomes more harmonized rather than a polarity with what you want to attract, it becomes harmonized with it and it becomes your natural way of how you think all the time. And you start then beginning to teach your children the same way of thinking. So you just catch them when they start saying things like, oh, with my luck it won't work out. Why have any of us ever learned to say, with my luck and having it mean things aren't going to work out? Why wouldn't you say and just have it as your habit, with my luck, it'll probably show up faster than it normally does. Why not have that kind of a way? Because what, here's what happens. As you begin to shift the way that you think and have an anticipation that this thing is going to work out for you, you can only act upon your thoughts. And as you, as, as you get these higher and higher thoughts, what happens is that, that the thought is now more aligned with what it is you want to attract, and then you start acting upon that thought. And as you start acting upon the thought that it will work out, that it's probably on its way, you start to see how this whole system all works. In other words, call it the universe, whatever you want, begins to conspire with you. It begins to act almost in where, where you suddenly become a collaborator with fate. And instead of fate being something that just might or might not happen to you, you're in collaboration with what it is that you want to attract. I mean, ask any physician, there's physicians here today, ask them about something called the will to live. Ask them about somebody who's going in for a corneal transplant and thinks that I'm going to see when this thing is done rather than someone who thinks it probably won't work out. And which one would they rather work with? What is this thing called the will to live? What is this thing, this inner kind of thing that says, I refuse to allow myself to think I say to my mother, who's 90 years old, 90, almost 91 years old, I was with her for the last five days, every day, all morning long with her, and she's been going through some difficulties and so on. Most of you saw her on the PBS show, if you saw the inspiration. She has always said to me how she was going to die. She said it to me when she was 60. 
what her death was going to look like, when she was going to die in her sleep, and it was going to be, you know, it was going to be a peaceful thing, and she was going to do it when she was ready. When she was ready, she would leave, and she would know when it was time. And she says, and don't think it's time. I said, well, you got a hangnail there. Maybe we should just move on with this. And she said, no, I'll tell you when I'm ready. But she, she has always said, I will never allow Alzheimer's into my life. She's always said, that is not something, she's, she'll say things like, well, I can't remember this name quite as well as I did before, but, but, but that concept of all, it's just not anything that I've ever allowed myself to think is a possibility. And I said, well, what if you're wrong? She'll say, well, who'll know the difference? <laughs> and they've done research on this, uh, you know, in, in, in studies on gerontology, where the, what does your life look like from 60 plus? versus what does your life look like below, from 60 uh, down to into your 20s. That people who live a dynamic life into their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, people who feel strong, who don't feel that getting older means that I have to in any way decline any place, physically or mentally, getting older has nothing to do with the concept of declining that when people are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and this is their perception of what their life is going to be like when they're in their 60s that those people have a much greater chance much greater chance of not attracting the kinds of diseases that are so much age related as do people who think of old as infirm and declining throughout their 20s 30s 40s and 50s that you change the way you believe about that and you say declining is not a possibility. I don't think about what's missing. You don't put your attention on what's missing. You don't tell other people about what's missing. And you don't tell other people about what you can't do and what, what isn't working and how terrible the world is. And the Tao teaches so much about, so much of it, is, it was uh, written for leaders, people in positions of power. But I've translated all of that into your own level of leadership. And the great leaders, the great leaders, are the ones who eschew violence. You have got to get yourself to a place where you don't allow yourself to have violent thoughts come into your consciousness. That means you got to watch the movies you're watching. That means the games that your children are playing, video games, have got to be monitored and removed when they have violence built into them. It means that you don't watch the news and you don't read the stories endlessly reaffirming what a terrible place this world is. It is not a terrible place. It's a perfect place. It's a beautiful place. There are just some leaders who are connected to Tao and others who are not. And we can create the kind of world that we want to create when enough of us begin to say, not part of my consciousness. Nope, I don't buy gossip. No, I don't buy violence. No, I don't have anything to do with that. And you just turn the channel, you turn it off. I pick up a Time magazine when I get on a flight and I go through and I say, I won't read the stories that involve killing. I won't read this. I don't need to hear any more about any more people blowing themselves up. I don't need to continue to have that as a part of my consciousness because I want to be someone who radiates out God-realized thinking. That's what I want to do. And I can't do that if I'm constantly being imbued with that. So I just go through the pages, page, page. And usually I say, oh, just threw away another $4.95. There's nothing in it to read. Every once in a while, good story about maybe Tiger Woods or something. But by and large, there's not much in there. And you don't have to fill yourself with that kind of energy. So you don't put your thoughts on what's missing. You don't put your thoughts on what always has been. You don't put your thoughts on what others want for you. Unless you want more of what others want for you to continue to show up into your life. So that if you're having conflicts with anybody that's out there, you don't have to put your attention on any thought that is out of harmony with the relationship that you would like to have. It doesn't have to be. You can have a love story replace a hate story by just changing your thoughts in any moment of your life. As you'll see, some of you will see it this afternoon as Katie works with some of you and does the work and teaches you to ask yourself these questions about how can you be sure? 
How can you be sure that that thought is true? Why not have a love relationship with your ex-husband or your ex-wife? Why not have a love relationship with your in-laws? Why not? Why not have it with everyone on the planet? Why not? Indeed, why not? Every moment of your life, this choice is yours. You can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. It's your call. God bless you and thank you for your attention. Namaste. Thank you.